Really, really excited here Wednesday afternoon to be visiting with Jeremy um, Dalber, and we are going to talk about American comics. You have just this incredible book, um, this American a History of Comics. My God, I cannot believe what you managed to accomplish with this thing. But anyway, welcome, and let's have some fun. Oh, amazing. Great. Okay. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here with you and to get to, as I was saying before we started, to meet you in person. You know, I, I, I've read your some of your books uh, and I'm just, you're, I'm such a fan of your work. So it's just great to be able to meet you in person. It's one of the pleasures of this kind of thing. Yes, a silver lining um, to all of this craziness that we're living through, surviving through. Jeremy, I know you went, you, you have this incredible, I mean, just even looking superficially you know, Harvard and then you are a Rhodes Scholar and then you go in and you start publishing these really important books you know coming through a kind of a history American studies training literary studies training um, Jewish studies but let's talk a little bit about that part of your journey and then maybe how that part of your journey has led to this incredible work you're doing in comic studies. Oh well, thank, well first thing for saying that, but you know, and 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 I think that the you know some part of this, and I, I suspect you feel the same way, is that you know we're in these businesses where we're lucky enough to sort of take interests that have uh, been part of our lives ever since we were little, and and kind of grow up and sort of think about them, um, uh, you know, with many of those animating interests and questions sort of continuing, and, and and that was certainly the case with me. So that was true with a lot of sort of the Jewish literature stuff that I had, I had worked on um, and, and, and that, that I grew up in a Jewish background and that was, that was very important to me. But also I grew up as a huge comics fan uh, and that was sort of very much a part of my, my life. In fact, in, in many ways, a much more fundamental uh, and formative part in certain ways than, than the Jewish literature that I read as a kid. Uh, um, I was, you know, what they would have called, what, what we would call a Marvel zombie kind of back in the in the days of growing up you and I I think are roughly of an age so in that sort of 80s period um, and just as you know I was saying you know this stuff is getting a little bit uh, maybe a little juvenile for me that was when this sort of so-called miracle year of 1986 happened uh, and you had uh, Watchmen and you had Dark Knight um, and also again because of my Jewish background uh, Mouse was that same year, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, and that was very influential uh, for me. I, I carried that book around in my high school backpack and, and read it over and over again, the first volume of it. Um, and then I, you know, I went to college and I, I went to graduate school and sometime around graduate, I, I wasn't paying that much attention. Um, and I was not at the time, I should say, um, you know, even though I went to comic shops in high school, I was not as mindful of some of the amazing stuff that was happening on the independent and alternative side uh, uh, at that at that period. So uh, at that point, uh, to my chagrin, now I was not a Love and Rockets uh, familiar. I wasn't familiar that much with them. I, I didn't know that much about that kind of stuff. Um, but later on, when I was in graduate school, people said, "You know, there's there's this new stuff, this Vertigo, the Sandman, and Preacher, and all this." That sort of got me back in, and then. Um, you know, I, I began to think as I got tenure, um, you know, where I am now at Columbia, uh, and said, you know, I'm interested in this stuff too. And one of the things I'm the most interested in, um, you know, is this relationship, as I think we are, between sort of communities of readers uh, and sort of the material and how that is sort of an ever changing and ever flowing uh, question. And that is true in sort of the work, some of the works you have up here, uh, and, and, and also within sort of this comics thing, which is why the book is sort of also a kind of history of. America through comics uh, and comics in America as, they, as there's this reciprocal relationship. Were there questions that you asked or that came, you came to, let's say, Jewish comedy, a serious history or your work on, you know, um, Yiddish plays, etc. Were there questions that you brought to those works that you also had when you came into this kind of project of you know this history of american comics yeah. i mean you know and it's interesting because it's one of the you're at it's a great question and, it, and and to me it was one of those things that really impacts um what i don't like in literature and in certain ways what i'm what i'm trying and less gravitating to towards comics i try to fight back against this bias which is 
I'm really interested in the interrelationship, as I was saying, between reader and audience, right? Uh, excuse me, writer and audience. So if, you know, what is trying to be done, how are they doing it? What's the ways in which that creates kind of readerly pleasure? And so works, let's say, of high modernism, works that are very uh, uh, abstract, uh, that aren't really sort of working with that kind of convention and connection uh, in whatever field, those are the ones that are sort of the most difficult for me and the ones that leave me cold in some sense the most. But put another way, those questions of, well, you know, how do you take these things, uh, these, these building blocks, and how do you put them together uh, in a certain way um, that, that then creates a connection with an audience? That to me, you know, is, is, is an evergreen question, uh, ever fascinating question, and can be applied uh, whether in comedy, where if you don't get a laugh, you know, you're probably doing something wrong, uh, or comics, where if you're not achieving a particular effect, uh, depending on what your medium, you know, your, your ambit is, uh, you, you're going to leave your audience behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so important. Um, the writer, the, say, text or the blueprint, if you will, and the audience. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, what we do with it, right, as an audience, not just there in location, but as a community and then as a people and then as a society, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, really great. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Jim. No, I was just gonna say, and you and I both know, you know, I think we were of that age also in our academic where that notion of interpretive communities really became sort of very strong, right? This idea of saying, and you know, one of the classic examples is, you know, what, how does one take like the X-Men uh, and interpret it, right? Um, and you can say sort of in 1960, you know, early 1960s, uh, when, when, when Lee and Kirby are doing this, they're thinking about science fiction, they're thinking about radiation, they're thinking about those kind of things. But very quickly, the various interpretive communities said, mm -hmm. this is about different kinds of marginalized groups, whether they be marginalized because of their sexual orientation, uh, or because of their disabilities, or because of uh, their ethnicity, right? And even, and, and, and they read these texts, as you're saying, 100% in a very different, uh, a way that is not necessarily uh, apparent in a literalistic reading of the material. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a hugely important part of the story that we're all uh, interested in as well, particularly, although not solely, when many of those kinds of direct representations, and this is something that you do so well, right, are not necessarily as commonly placed within, especially the mainstream, uh, uh, material of comics. Um, and right. So that, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, as you know, I, I put a lot of my eggs in the basket of co-creation. And part of it is that, you know, <laughs> there's, as you know, there's a kind of juggernaut out there that wants to position us as passive absorptive sponges. Yeah. And I'm, you and I both know that's not the case. And we know, you know, just looking at history in general, but um, of course we don't want to let people off the hook either. Um, but yeah, we're very active co-creators. Um, when you were doing this history, American comics, a history, um, is there, <laughs> I know you've done lots of interviews and, and so on and so forth. Um, maybe there was even a proposal that you had put together when you first got the contract for this book, but What's your elevator kind of version of the discoveries you've made in this, this majestic, beautiful, so well-researched um, foundational book, actually? Well, I appreciate you saying, I mean, of course, I appreciate it. this music to my ears. Um, I think that the main thing that if it was that for a lot of the case, not all by any stretch of the imagination, uh, including your work, but, but most of the stories of comics, uh, you know, you either had people who were telling those stories from a kind of mainstream corporate superhero uh, kind of, uh, or, and, to, and to a lesser extent, slightly broader genres like horror comics and science fiction comics. And sort of, then there were a lot of other people, particularly in the, in the academic world, who were really focusing on what we could call alternative or independent comics or something like that. Um, and what was fascinating to me was that, you know, as part from teaching a course, as, as we do, um, you know, that was not really the story that made sense to me when you looked at the material. You had a lot of people, uh, you know, the, the Hernandez brothers were saying, we grew up reading Archie comics, we grew up reading uh, superhero, you know, all of these kind of things, romance comics. 
you know, we have Alan Moore saying, I love Love and Rockets. Um, these are kind of everyone saying we love EC, you know, um, and all of the people before that saying, you know, when we're making our decisions, we're thinking about these comic strips that are really sort of side by side, but everybody is reading, right? And so that was part of this, and to say, let's try and tell the story sort of sitting uh, in our seats as people in these positions in 1935 and 1955 and 1975 and what they're actually doing. Uh, and I think that that was going to give actually a more organic uh, view and, and explain a lot of things that maybe this sort of siloing out uh, didn't necessarily uh, explain as well, or sometimes it would obfuscate or whatever. Mm. Um, so that was, I think, sort of the main uh, uh, kind of issue. The the other, I, I would say, although other, many people have done this a little bit more, right, was to say, let's just remember that a lot of these creators uh, are not just reading other comics. Uh, and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, and particularly um, there was so much interplay with science fiction, uh, with fantasy, uh, with other things. These are, these are things that as a kid I was a huge fan of as well. Uh, and so it was fun to kind of bring that material a little bit. Uh, in, um, you know, in as well as well as the political background. So I guess if you, that's the long, I guess it was a long elevator ride. That's the, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the yeah, ride. no, really great. Um, and kind of reaffirming and celebrating the tremendous cross pollination, the tremendous cross influencing that is comics history, but also that comics creatives and comics audiences are situated in time and place. And I think that, yeah. you know, and this may be, I, I've, I've had the advantage of sort of looking at the slide deck, which, which our listeners might not. But, I, you know, a third thing that I wanted to be very mindful of was the fact that the story of America, you know, it was very easy to say, well, this is the story of America, right? But the, that, that story was full of all sorts of uh, boundaries and, and holes, which led to certain kinds of erasures and things like that. Um, and it was telling a very pretty, and so I wanted as much as possible building on work of people like you and other people, right, to be able to say here at least is a little bit of trying to, to, to point out where those erasures occur um, and, and, and what we're not paying as much attention to. And when we might not think about those erasures, but actually, if you look at it, you're actually like, okay, well, here they are. Um, and so, so that I, I felt like needed to be a part of the story uh, as well. Yeah, absolutely. The you know, getting going back even to one of my kind of first, our first dis questions, discussions here, which is, um, you know, it's so important, the framing and the questions that we bring to our work. Yeah. Because if we bring the same sets of questions that we've seen before and before that before, before, um, we're going to generally kind of repeat you know, findings, but if we bring something fresh like you have, um, a, a new framing um, in the way that you've just articulated, then then there is going to be um, kind of discovery both of where there's been a deliberate erasures and where there's also been formative uh, creations and discoveries. Um, so this is a quote from you of since NAST, American comics have shaped wars and inspired movements. They've provided ethical edification and moral scandal. And bluntly, they've inspired pop culture. And we have this, you know, this great image here with, you know, Superman and, you know, Hitler. And, and then we also have, you know, some of these comics that have been, we've been pointing to that and some have said, you know, even started wars, right? So, yeah, could you, I don't know, elaborate a little bit more on this? Sure. I mean, you know, and and, and this also gets back in some ways to the biographical thing, or again, maybe contra, but where people, you know, as I say, you know, I came from a Jewish studies background, and people say, oh, well, you know, uh, so much of this first wave of comic books, not really comic strips, but comic books, was Jewish, you know, was there something about Jews in, in, in comic books, right? Was, are these superheroes all Jewish? Right? And you might be, you know, maybe counterintuitively or maybe not. I, my, I'm much more dubious about that proposition uh, than many of the other uh, uh, scholars out there are. Uh, I think in many ways they are much more interested in being sort of American pastiche artists um, and taking from sort of around them uh, uh, than, than from sort of some kind of Jewish uh, I think the one, maybe one of the few exceptions, as I say in the book, is, is getting to one of these images you put up, right, which is to say that 
um, we sometimes don't think because we're backshadowing through Pearl Harbor, through VE Day, through VJ Day, right? How isolationist certain parts of America were uh, before Pearl Harbor. And, um, and I think that having a lot of Jews uh, in this very early comic book industry made this a much more pro intervention. I'm talking, we're talking a very, very, very small window between Action Comics number one and Pearl Harbor, only a couple of years. But uh, by and large, there was a lot more pro intervention sentiment. Uh, uh, and I think that that may have to do with the fact these are a lot of first generation Jews. Uh, you know, their parents were immigrants, uh, by and large. Um, they, they had relatives in Europe, you know, they could see. And, and so I think, you know, does that mean that they, that's why I use that word shaped, I think very consciously there, they didn't start <laughs> this war, uh, um, but, but they were certainly helping to influence this. That said, we always have to think about our biases, right? Comic books by definition, and certainly superhero comics, maybe I shouldn't say that, superhero comics by definition are pro-conflict, right? They, they, you need a uh, battle. Um, and so, you know, that's not to say that they are militant by their very nature, but, you know, some of these charges that were laid against them, that was, well, isn't violence always the answer for you superheroes? Kind of, you know, and uh, that then led to, you know, people at the time were like, oh, this is ridiculous. But of course, that led to some of these very searching critiques within comic books themselves that we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years. So it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting process. Uh, there. Uh, but as you say, sort of, you know, uh, and as you have uh, on, the, on the lower right, we have political cartoons that are very much shaping sort of the climate of political opinion uh, as well, starting from whether it's the Spanish American War uh, or whether it's moving into sort of the McCarthyism or in shaping the Cold War. Uh, people are looking at these political cartoons to see what they're doing. So you're 100 mm -hmm. right that uh, beautiful yeah beautiful thank you uh for for expanding on that um and of course there's another very important kind of moment right on the sort of flipped page of the one that we just uh that i just quoted but and i'm gonna read and comics move to the center of the american popular imagination is occurring side by side with an explosion of graphic literature that has entered the American literary imagination, speaking to and advancing the central concerns of American literature. And I know we've seen different articulations of this, of course, responding to this kind of shift, but maybe you can tell me and our audiences a little bit more about this. I think you know uh, this one. I'll be briefer about, but I think, but 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 hopefully more pungent. Um, that uh, you know, I suspect that uh, if this is for an, uh, uh, an undergraduate course or even a graduate course, uh, many of you are younger uh, than the two of us are. Um, and so, if we can, we can, I will just tell you that if you had said to us when we were kids, you will find comic books in between harder or hardish covers in your public library. You'll find them in your high school library or your elementary school library. You'll find them in bookstores. We would have said, "This is like utopia. This is a dream." Um, so, and 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 certainly, we would never have thought that they would be able to uh, be uh, discussing this wide range of concerns, you know, in these kinds of ways uh, and with this kind of institutional approval that we have now. And and, and uh, you know, as and and that explosion has also allowed for a wide amount of uh, uh, different kinds of ambitions. Um, and I think, like you, uh, it doesn't matter to me whether or not your ambition is just to do a crackerjack action thing or to do uh, a slice of life sort of very, uh, you know, literarily ambitious novel in graphic form. Those are two different ambitions, and if you meet them, great. Um, but but both are now possible and in your library and what have you. So that's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And look, I mean, you and I both teach courses on comics True. <laughs> and you're at columbia i'm at ut austin and right. and my goodness um yeah when right. you and i were phd students certainly even then um yeah um the idea that we could be doing this kind of stuff uh was would, was very foreign right um yes i think that's um gosh yeah going back to something that you've already brought up um but very much kind of weaves its way through your work here is the this history is also a history of erasures 
And of course, you know, race and gender uh, first, you know, kind of more pro most prominently, but also, um, you know, there's, you know, you and I both know issues of, you know, queer creatives, industry makers also being erased. But here we have in this slide, you know, we have a range of um, certainly, a, you know, black creative to women creatives. And then um, like you had mentioned already with, you know, our Jewish um, team there in Action Comics. Um, but yeah, what, what do you make of this here on the spot? Let's say you're in front of your, intro your introduction to comics undergrads in terms of this erasure and this history making say well you know it's a great i mean i think that there are a couple of things that i i try and point out right i mean one is that uh you know is what we would call what you and i would call a historiographical point the point about sort of the writing of history which is to say the point that they, these things were there right and they and as a result uh, our notion of them not being there is a historically incorrect story. And there's something about the writing of the history that we have to take a kind of close look at. Why wasn't, why weren't these things included in earlier accounts? Um, because it's not like, you know, so that's one aspect, right? The second aspect is why were there so few of them, right? And very frequently that question is more complicated than we would think because a lot of, not by any, not by any search of all times, but a lot of times in a commercial business, if something was working, um, there was an incentive to keep it going, right? So how is that balanced against these sort of structural inequities that then prevent and act against certain kinds of commercial interests? So you have both of those things at the same time. So for example, uh, as, I, as you know, of course, there were a black comic strips uh, and they appeared in a kind of uh, 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 black syndicates, comic strip syndicates in black papers, right? So there's this entire separate uh, industry that itself could be quite successful, um, you know, from a, but, but it was marginalized and hived off from the story uh, as it was always told, which was a very kind of white story. Um, and then, you know, how much of it was when there are these representations, when they do manage to make it through this scrim uh, of uh, structural uh, divergence, right, and structural racism and sexism. And, you know, what parts of this, uh, um, how do they appear? Uh, and, and why do they appear in what kind of ways? Um, so, for example, there are, and, and how is that also very much, uh, I guess, reflecting out of uh, other kinds of uh, presentations of these questions of the time, because one of these things, as we were saying before, is the, the, you know comics are not in isolation, right? So it's not surprising that when you have all of these 1930s strong women, Catherine Hepburn types, Rosalind Russell types in the movies, Lois Lane looks like them and is actually a very uh, autonomous figure with a lot of agency, right? When post-war, World War II, I'm talking about post-World War II, you have a kind of push into a kind of studied heteronormative um, father knows best white picket fence model right uh, this is something that's going on in a lot of places Lois Lane becomes a much flatter uh, much less interesting uh, character but in many ways no more uninteresting than many of the other characters who are in other kinds of popular culture things at the time. So, uh, you know, a lot of different things uh, that are going on there. And then there are some things which really couldn't appear at all. And here, I think particularly I'm thinking of uh, matters of sexual orientation. Uh, and so, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, coded material um, that, that sort of appears. One of the things I had to cut from the book, because the book was originally much longer, if you can believe that, um, was uh, there's an EC story, which is clearly about a, uh, uh, a man who, ha who has a, uh, uh, a homosexual, homoerotic crush on this guy, on his friend of his. The friend gets married, or is going to get married, and so, you know, he kills him and sort of keeps his brain so he can have him forever, that kind of thing, right? Um, you know, this is, I mean, you know, it doesn't take a, uh, a, an interpretive genius to kind of see what's going on uh, here. But of course, uh, you know, the, the word gay, the word sort of the low romance, that, none of that is spoken 
uh, at all, obviously, in these EC comics in the 1950s, even the, you know, um, so to, to get our students to kind of read some of this stuff when it does appear, uh, you know, in these kinds of uh, coded ways. I feel like I'm going on for a very long time, but that's a... Yeah, no, really um, significant. It, it got me thinking while you were talking, gosh, if we had, in a way, if we'd kind of gotten things right earlier, especially yeah. in maybe comic studies, by asking the more expansive questions, the more inclusive questions, maybe we might not have the same kind of pushback when we do see in kind of in DEI inclusivity kind of moves on the part, especially in superhero spaces, you know? Yeah. No, I think that, I think that's right. I think that, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, one of the amazing things, you know, I'm getting a lot of press about some of this pushback. And I say, you know, it is incredible the number of, you know, this, this expansion tells all of these amazing stories, right? And if you're a comics fan, who wouldn't want to hear more stories? Like it's, uh, you know, it's been, you know, and, and, and the idea that you really just genuinely have these just amazing new things, who wouldn't want to hear? And uh, that, that, that seems to be sort of the, the basis of, of, of so much of the excitement that I had uh, in encountering even some of this stuff that I didn't know about because it wasn't in a lot of the historical accounts. Look at all these amazing sort of materials that are out there um, and how much more could there be or hopefully will there be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really amazing. Um, and this, you know, kind of gets, to, you know, nice kind of move um, yeah. from where we were just talking, but not just the kind of industry side, the writers, the creatives, the artists, um, the editors, you know, yeah. the machinery itself, but also, say, in front of the camera, the representational erasures as well. And you know, I was thinking about just very, you know, the Baz Reeves stuff and Lone, Lone Ranger and then, of course, Zorro. But there's so much here that, you know, these are just examples of the kind of their missed opportunities, I guess. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, in a lot of cases, one of the things that, of course, I didn't have time to do or space to do, but I, I'd love to, you know, and people are doing, but is to to see these as uh, the product of working writers on a deadline who aren't also thinking, especially in the mainstream comics, who aren't thinking that much about these questions. And that's where I think a lot of what, the work of unconscious bias uh, kind of comes in. Um, so they're saying, you know, when I'm thinking about Zorro, let's take an example, right? What am I, I have a week to write this script. Uh, you know, I'm not thinking of this as a work for the ages. I'm thinking of this as a paycheck that's going to go out on the newsstand. It's going to be gone. Nobody's going to, right? This is, uh, I don't know when this brave though, it looks like mid eighties for, for me, but, uh, um, you know, I'm not thinking about this as this is an eternal sort of thing, right? So what am I putting into my head? Unfortunately, right? Am I, I'm thinking what in my head, the stock of stereotypical caricatured material that I happen to know from the Zorro stories that I've already seen in the movies or the, the Zorro stories in the comic books or maybe from a slightly earlier generation from the pulps. So all of that is regurgitating and therefore deepening these same kinds of stereotypes. Nobody's going to break. And because, you know, very frequently you have, especially in the mainstream, a very small group uh, of people who are working on them. I'm, I'm lucky enough to team teach my comics class here at Columbia with Paul Levitz, who is the former president of DC Comics. Um, and he is fond of saying that as, when he sort of was in his heyday, the number of people who were working in the mainstream comics industry, you could fit into a small ballroom, right? And it was a, you know, so you have a small number of people, they're all in this kind of echo, they're in this echo chamber. Um, and so they're, you know, is it saying, boy, I want to create a caricatured, stereotyped, racist kind of guy? No, you know, that's not what, but is that often the uh, outcome, you know, because of all of the... Right. Yes. So that's that's where I'm interested in how those steps do and don't get uh, uh, taken. And I think what's wonderful now is also with uh, our technological changes, you know, the kind of research that you can do to smarten yourself up on this, if you're a writer, can occur in a fraction of the time that you would you would be able to do uh, in advance of this. You know, you get this deadline. Um, you know, okay, you had a you had a week to write it. Well, in 1985, before the end, we were old enough to remember, what were you going to do, really? You know, go to your public library. How much stuff about this kind of stuff would you have in your public library? 
um, you know, uh, but now you just click and, you know, now it's sort of, if you don't do the work, it's kind of your fault um, in a way that I have a little bit more, I don't want to say charity, maybe charity, but empathy for, for the structural matters then uh, in a certain mm -hmm. kind of way. Um, but yeah, also, we, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think also, you know, when uh, you have writer, you know, as, as the country, be, be, you know, becomes both bigger and smaller, there's a lot more opportunity to sort of reach out to people who really do know and say, you know, hey, can I uh, ask you about this? Can I learn about this? Which I think is great, too. Right. Yeah. No, that's. Um, yeah, today, in fact, we should be even we should be harder on folks when they get it wrong, yes. because there's just no excuse. It's like, you know, Chris Rock at the academies. He's like, what? Like, <laughs> where are the Latinx, the, his, the Latinos here? You know, come on. You like you live in L.A. Like, let's you know, let's make an you know, you don't even have to make an effort. Um, you know, where would I find anybody? You know, look online. <laughs> right. like, it's like, yeah. It, right. I agree 100 percent with that formulation. It, you know, if you say now, if you do something and you say, well, I got the research wrong, like, what are you doing? It's it, it's I mean, thanks to people like you, you know, we're, but it's out there, you know. So, yeah. You know, when you were, you know, a lot very often we spend, um, you know, our time with the superheroes, the heroes of our stories and um, we also spend time with our villains and our supervillains, but I wanted to ask you, was there anything, you know, we know that there's, you cover a lot of the business as usual in terms of stereotypes. And I've, I've, I've you know, brought some slides in here where these are very clear, um, denigrative, racist, very clear. Um, we can talk a little bit about that, but I also wanted to ask you if there were some like surprises here, like ruptures in that business as usual. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think for, you know, as you say, sort of business as usual, as we're saying in this conversation, you know, I, you know, we shouldn't, I wish we, in some ways, because of the, uh, for social reasons that we could have said, well, comic books was a sole offender in this regard. Right. But, uh, you know, of course that is, that's not the case in the comic books. Um, the comic book writers and, and artists were doing what was sadly present in lots of um, and probably all mass cultural media and, and visual media of the time. I mean, I only wish that blackface had been limited just to comic books. Right. But of course, that wasn't the case at this particular point. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I do think that there are sometimes uh, uh, some surprises, um, but they are. Unfortunately, the surprises often went the other way, to be honest. So uh, I was, you know, really appalled, for example, at how, you know, you how uh, illiberal the liberal underground of the countercultural comics could mm. be. And I think that comes out sort of in the, you know, in the book that that there 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 is a lot of material. You know, you're saying, well, here are these 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 people who are in some ways patting themselves on the back in order to be kind of enlightened or progressive or liberal and really you look at the stuff and you say you know there's, there's a lot of stuff that's really hard. And, and, and that that the underground had its own kind of dynamics uh, in certain ways of exclusionary of marginalization uh to women to you know, certainly to people uh of the of queer people uh that 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 were that was present there so uh that was a surprise and, and really not not such a pleasant uh, in that in that regard, um, I do think that there were times where, and particularly in some of the DC comics, um, where you really did see a kind of civic religious message of tolerance, which was lovely to see. Um, you know, where you really had um, very strongly put anti-racist uh, uh, messages. I'm talking about in the 40s, right? I'm talking about the, right, um, and I, I particularly during the wartime period. Uh, I'm not saying that those didn't coexist side by side with certain kinds of caricatures, right? But uh, unfortunately, that's another thing, you know, in telling the stories of human beings is that there's complicated hypocrisy uh, uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's present. But you did have, you know, some of these justice society stories where you really have people saying, and you have like little kids uh, who include, you know, black kids. They seem to include kids of different ethnicities, right? And some of these boy uh, commando type stories you have 
you know, saying we're all part of this grand project together. Um, that does still maybe I'm you know that still does still feel kind of inspiring in a way. But then you turn the page, you get to this Captain Marvel thing, you say, oh, that's not great. Oh, that's terrible. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, that's also one of the things I think that we all do. When we do cultural history, and you're right to point it out, is to say, well, you know, this is not not it's not all homogenous. There's all these sort of churns kind of going back uh, and, and forth uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny when I was as I was reading your book, um, I couldn't help but think more deeply about you know, certain moments in your book where um, it triggered the idea of the Jewish superhero. <laughs> and and um, your book is, is about much more than anything in, in speci- you know, very specifically, it's about weaving together this grand tapestry. Um, however, there were some threads that got me to this place. And I was wondering what, you, you know, how you would ra- respond to where are the Jewish superheroes? Well, I do think that, you know, not surprisingly, and this was a dynamic when I wrote about this in my Jewish comedy book too, that for many decades and sort of, let's say the, what we would now call the gold and the silver ages, right? You know, you, you did not have Jews who are in the mass culture business interested in telling Jewish stories. Um, and that was primarily because they viewed these, this, I think, as a business. They were trying to reach a very wide audience, and they felt that the way to do that was to tell stories uh, that were as universal as possible. Now, we can both understand that there's a lot of sin that universal, why can't a Jewish experience, why can't a Latinx experience, why can't these experiences be universal? Of course they can, right? But that was, in some ways, the category error that was made at the time and the only thing that i can say in the defense of that category error was that everybody else was also making that category error right it wasn't like by and large the comic strip business was saying let's tell these stories through a particular kind of diversity right if you look at the top 50 comic strips um you know that that they were all vying to be right uh, uh in that golden age of Super, they they all basically looked roughly the same too, right? There are exceptions, but basically they all look the same. Um, and that's also one of the things that I try and do in the book is to say, like, I don't want to try and make a decision about someone with a 2021 head. I want to try and make a decision with someone with a 1938 head um, and and see what it is. But that, mm-hmm. so I think that said, you know, they, they didn't. And then that continued for sort of a long uh, period of time. I think the person who did a lot for this uh, was Chris Claremont. Um, who really did not put, you know, Kitty Pride uh, in, you know, and also this was a period where, you know, preceding Spiegelman, or at least preceding Spiegelman in the mainstream, he was already serializing it, arguably, uh, or about to serialize it in, in, in Raw. But, you know, you have someone saying, let's take this sort of interest in the Holocaust, let's take this sort of more explicit sort of Jewish, and, and we'll put it out. So, but you know as you say as you see there's not that much of it still in fact uh, i'd love to see more mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah likewise um this is something that you bring up toward the end of your book and kind of loops us back to an earlier point we made um 2010 and this gay, you know the gay character kevin making history archie history yeah. um 2010 um gosh seems so late in the game but let's let's talk about this what how what are you what are what are your sort of take what should we be taking away from this well the two things that i found fascinating about the, when i was looking at the kevin keller stories uh you know was uh, there's a comment that i'm it's in the book but i'm so i might misquote it but whatever i say in the book is the right one right as opposed to what i say here um is that uh the 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 ceo i think john goldwater of of, of archie then sort of says we want Riverdale to be sort of the same open, welcoming place that it's always been, which is just such a wonderful articulation of how comics both stay the same and radically change uh, at the same time, right? Is that, you know, the Archie comics, the Riverdale of 1943 would not have been welcoming to someone like Kevin Keller, I think that is fair to say. Um, but, uh, you know, in some ways, 
we can have this kind of ever present continuity while allowing kind of radical change to take place. But, and this gets to the second point, that radical change can only take place when there is a constituency that's ready for it. Um, and the thing that made Kevin Keller kind of work was not, let's say, and, and become sort of a significant character, was the fact that they put it out there, which good for them, right? But that it then sold a ton of copies, of which good for everybody, I suppose, or most people. And, you know, the other thing is also to think about how rapid social change is. You know, I mean, I think Glee comes out in 2009. Um, and so for our students now, you know, they were little kids, probably weren't able to stay up till eight o'clock to watch uh, something like Glee. But for those of us who are really adults, it's almost incredible how radically the landscape on television and mass culture in general has shifted. Uh, if you remember sort of before Glee uh, and after, not that there weren't gay characters, on television before, but just it's been, you know, logarithmic almost in its development. Um, and so, you know, uh, um, but but this showed the success, the commercial success showed that there was a possibility of doing it. Um, and then, uh, you know, great. And then there was uh, that, that opened lots of doors. Yeah, it's true. It's, um, oh my goodness, the response time, you know, you don't have to wait for the the letter calls now it's like boom 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 right. um that's right um so yeah this is you know as you know this is kind of where my passions have been of late in comics but um you know the kind of dei moves on the part of marvel and dc etc in this quote we have morales's enormous popular and critical appeal not only saved him from that replacement fate migrating from the alternate universe he originated into the main Marvel universe, but helped propel a new wave of diverse characters who were more frequently living their identities, living their identities, not just looking them. Can you expand on this living versus looking? Sure, and I think this gets back to some of the stuff that we were talking about before, about sort of representation behind the camera, so to speak, as well, uh, and, and sort of better research uh, and, and sort of more responsibility that's being taken, um, in the sense that, you know, it, it is not so hard uh, uh, to, to say, to find a character necessarily, uh, and, you know, and, and certainly to, to articulate a character that exists that, uh, um, that looks different. Uh, um, and that, that, that sort of represents a particular kind of identity, right? But, uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that as part of their story, a part of the character, the way they make it, right, that they are uh, necessarily um, incorporating sort of, uh, you know, these the elements of that kind of life or that character that would have shaped them uh, into their own uh, story, then into the stories that are largely speaking being told. Um, and, uh, you know, that is something that instead, you know, it's important to make them uh, 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 into sort of living, breathing, plausible characters. So I remember sort of reading uh, G. Willow Wilson's uh, Kamala Khan, Ms. Marvel, for the first time and saying, you know, this is just a wonderful example of, you know, that in some ways, what is it to write a story about uh, American family who were practicing Muslims uh, one of whom becomes a superhero, right? What would that be like, right? And 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 Wilson, you know, the, you know, who who understands obviously, you know, is a great writer and, and, and you know, um, un, and understands his background very well, comes to it and sort of presents this kind of character, I think, marvelously. Um, and I think that uh, you know, increasingly, as you were saying before, that responsibility is now weighs very heavily on everybody um, who is doing this writing. Um, whether or not they feel some representational responsibility as creators, to be honest, to sort of the, no, they're, they're, their backgrounds, or they're not, uh, and they say, okay, well, uh, I need to do this because that's what that's where the state of play is now, and either we're going to hear about it online or just for my own sake. Um, and I'm delighted because that's what that's what you want out of these kind of stories, uh, um, and I think that the you know that again speaks to regardless of where the aim for the uh, the audience is, uh, a general understanding that the, the, the game has been raised across the board. Um, this is not fish wrapping that's going to come out on a newsstand and, and be there 
you know, you know, garbage a week later. This is this is mm. great stuff. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, wow. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Um, it is interesting that, and you know, we'll talk about here this convergence culture, but um, that the more money in the in the the kind of creating of a story that has diversity front and center um, or or not, the more fear there seems to be, the more conservation there seems to be. And so like, you know, DC and Marvel are only now in the big tent spaces and then MCU and the Warner Brothers DC Entertainment kind of coming around to diversity and the importance of not just kind of white characters in brown or black face, but actual, you know, presence, com complexity. Um, and then, but it's still like, there's a dearth of this, right, uh, still. Um, but let's talk about maybe that as a segue into convergence culture. Comics, comics history is really a convergence culture history, really, right? I think that's I think that's right. And, you know, as you're pointing out, you know, it's been a, it's been a part of the comics history from the very beginning. The yellow kid, one of the earliest characters in sort of the American comic strip history, he's being merchandised all over the place. There's all sorts of all this kind of stuff. Right. So it's really just just a part of the story, um, you know, and, you know, that that said, I think it is interesting now that there is no question that uh you know maybe with the yellow kid they saw all of these sort of various merchandise but they probably knew the yellow kid also from all the comics that they were reading certainly someone like blondie or little orphan annie uh they were reading. you know here i think 85 90 95 percent of the people who know captain america who know iron man who certainly know the guardians of the galaxy they're coming to it from the comics uh, excuse me from the from the screen uh and not from the comics um and that obviously you know that that shift i mean I, one of the big metaphors for this uh as i had said uh in the book is when you know dc and marvel move their offices basically from new york to uh los angeles to cal to, to, to california right and now they are the kind of ip tail uh of the uh the, the larger media dog which was really not the case uh, uh up till you know before uh, a decade or 15 years ago um i do think though apropos the you know the the, the, the di question one of the, the quotes that i found sort of leading up to black panther which i think still remains really a high watermark of uh, to examine a lot of these questions really was from the producer uh of black Panther. you could tell this was a line that he had used uh in a lot of uh conference rooms in la uh, was uh that he said look you know it's really like it's Black Panther is like a Fast and Furious movie. It's like one of the Fast and Furious movies. Yes, there's a very diverse cast, but people don't come for the diversity. Uh, they come for the cars. And if we can make a movie, if Fast and Furious makes a movie that there's a lot of good car chases and a lot of people, like, people don't care. They're not going to be turned off. They're not going to be turned on. They're going to come to watch the movie. And that was his argument before Black Panther came out for Black Panther. I think what became clear once the movie came out was that that was true but not the only reason by any stretch of the imagination why black panther uh, uh connected so strongly and 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 you know I, I don't think i also don't think by the way that it would have connected so strongly if it hadn't been an amazing movie right i think that's always a, a part of it too um but uh you know there was this aspect where the concept in certain ways is so strong um of these things the, the you know that uh there is no reason for uh, uh, the studios, in my opinion, not to take sort of bold chances with the casting, not to do sorts of things, because overall, it's part of a gigantic megaplex of saying, you know, we're going to come to the uh, to watch the 37th movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And, 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 and so why not take these chances? I also think that, you know, the, the, the just the gigantic, I mean, what an amazing thing that Marvel Studios has been able to do, the amount uh, that they have been able to do in terms of you know the sheer amount of content they put out means that they can take chances uh and why not and then see what works and what doesn't work and if it you know maybe you'll, you're not going to think it's going to be a success but why not try um and that's true in all sorts of different angles like wandavision was a you know a bizarre experiment but worked that button tremendously well and, and obviously i love it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this this is the time, right? This right. is the time. Um, <laughs> right. You know, at yes. while we're saying this, right? So the, we don't, the big two, it's funny, you know, when I tell students, look, actually Scholastic is the one that's making all the money right now. Um, but yeah, I know you um, also talk a little bit about this, quite a little, quite a, quite a bit about this toward the end of your book um, and the graphic novel for YA and middle, middle school and Scholastic. But yeah, move over Rover on this one. DC and Marvel <laughs> are kind of on the, you know, let's put them on the bench for a second. I think that's right. I mean, I think that, you know, if people say, you know, I sometimes I get in these interviews, you know, what's the future of comics? What's going to, what's going to happen with it? And I say, you know, if you're talking about comics as a medium, I mean, you know, it's phenomenally successful. And then for the reason that you've put here on the screen, I mean, some Renee, uh, Renee Telgemeier, excuse me, mm -hmm. um, you know, is just uh, a colossus. Um, and she's a colossus by any standard, right? Uh, uh, not, you know, of, of publishing. She is, uh, you know, a dad Pilkey uh, is uh, the, these two, these two individuals. And, you know, the kids are just reading this comic form and lapping it up in ways that I think are, in, in certain ways, are similar, uh, although the technology is different, to the comic strips of the 30s, the 20s and 30s. Everyone is growing up with dad Pilkey and Raina Telgemeier on their shelves. And there's mm -hmm. no reason to think that when they get older, they're not going to say, um, they're, you know, oh, I'm done with comics as a medium. I'll just turn to other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think that in the YA middle grade, uh, you know, picture book sort of early reader world uh, in the graphic form, you know, publishing is extremely interested in publishing own voices material, publishing diverse material. Uh, schools are extremely interested in putting that stuff on the curricula. Um, you know, so I wish I, th you know, which is a, a wonderful way of sort of making sure that there's a market uh, uh, for this stuff as well. If you know that, uh, you know, you have the chance for this to be taught in curriculum in schools, um, you know, you're going to keep publishing it. Uh, and so I think I think that that it's not just that the kids are going to be all right, but they're going to get a, a wide range of material. And then they're going to come up and say, as they already are, why am I not seeing this material in some of the other sort of corners of the comics world? Um, mm -hmm. I'm growing up with it. Yeah, it's why, and you talk about this in your book, but um, you know, now you go to the library as as we talk, as we mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation, it's not like it was when we were kids or even <laughs> when we were like you know teenagers. It's the the big the biggest section of our library here is honestly graphic novels, uh, comics, um, and then Raina's work, <laughs> uh, right? Um, she's such a sweetheart. Um, I had. Um, and I apologize for the slide because somehow I don't know um, an autocorrect on her name, but um, she's, you'd never think that she's probably like a fortune 500, right? right. Um, <laughs> uh, she's just this incredibly cool, you know, really sweet, gifted, you know, lovely person um, that's uh -huh. been able to bring this, this stuff into the imaginations of all of our, of our kids. You are, an author of YA fiction. And this, this quote from Booklist, your debut novel offers a hero's journey from the perspective of a villain, perfect for fans of superhero stories in search of something new. Wow. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about this? Well, sure. I mean, you know, thank you for finding it and sort of bringing it up. You know, um, I, you know, like we were saying sort of from the beginning, I, I, I was always writing as a kid. And, you know, I wasn't writing monographs with footnotes as a kid. I was writing sort of stories, adventure stories or whatever, you know, not they were any good, but that was a part of me that I wanted to keep, uh, you know, and it turns out that maybe like you, I have the brain of a 12 year old. That's, uh, you know, and so ultimately that was the kind of book that that, that I wanted to write. And um you know like sometimes happens you know you come up with sort of a fun concept and and you know it sticks with you and you say, okay you know and you're you're doing graphic stuff too right i mean you're you're working on creative fiction and stuff like mm -hmm. that yeah in fact if you're the brain of a 12 year old i'm the brain of a, a three-year-old i think <laughs> um, um yeah my my picture books um you know i've been coming out i have a new one coming out this this spring and then yes i do have 
some uh, you know middle middle grade and then YA stuff coming out as well. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I just love it though that you've take it's the the perspective of the villain, the super villain, um, kind of going back to one of our earlier slides. And was there something exciting to you to kind of take that perspective and run with it? Well, I thought that, you know, one of the things that was interesting to me was that, you know, when we're, when we're as human beings, um, and certainly, you know, when we're trying to figure things out as sort of, uh, you know, kids, sort of young adults, sort of, you know, we often do terrible things but we don't actually think that we're doing, you know, or we know, we, we, you know, we don't often think that we're doing the things that are, they're, they're, they're going to be end up being as terrible as we think that they're going to be. We don't quite understand consequences. Um, we often try uh, uh, or trying out different kinds of roles, uh, you know, some of which are not the ones that we will hopefully end up with, um, but are, you know, not necessarily the nicest parts of ourselves. Um, you know, and I thought that this would be an interesting way of saying, how am I trying to figure out who I am? Um, but one of the things is, as, as you and I both know, you know, about sort of the fantasy kind of medium um, is that you can present kind of outsized consequences quite easily. So, you know, if we kind of rage in a high school class or we say something unkind to someone, okay, that's what, but if we have a super suit, <laughs> then the whole thing is going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, put it you know this way. Um, you know, in the book, like you know, I want you know this kid wants to uh, you know impress uh, you know the person he wants to go out with, right? Uh, so you know, so of course he robs Tiffany's, right? Because like, what else are you going to do? You know, you're getting that, right? And, and this is not great thinking, right? But that's uh, whatever. So it was fun to try to do that, and I think I, I don't know. I'd be interested to hear what you what, about you, but writing creatively often you know really did give me a better insight into the ways in which the creative process worked for some of these people i mean do you find that or, or? Mm. oh yeah definitely um yeah and it it it's a constant reminder too of kind of checking my theory brain because right. you know a lot of a lot of the decisions as we just you know very briefly discussed um you know, some of the decisions are decisions uh, based on, you know, an 11th hour deadline, um, a kind of scramble here and there, uh, you know, things that, you know, when you're on the other side of the theory side of the table, you don't know about and you make certain evaluations that don't really resonate well with the actual circumstances of the creating. So I agree. I also think, I'll be honest, I mean, you know, when Milton said, look, I'm, I'm more into Satan than, you know, you know, <laughs> Jesus or, you know, um, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an anti-hero kind of guy. Like, I think that's where the, <laughs> the, the interest and complexity, and maybe that gets us back to Chris Claremont, right? I mean, talk about genius uh, in terms of that kind of, you know, development of anti-hero complexity. But yeah, no, I love it. I love that you've done this. And I hope there's more of this in you um, for us. From your lips to uh, my agents in the publisher's ears. That's all I can, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. I'd like to write, I'm, I'm finishing one now about a ghost in a Fifth Avenue apartment. So I hope that'll be on some shelves at some point. Beautiful. Um, so teaching at Columbus, uh, Columbia, I'm sorry, and you mentioned Paul Levitt earlier. Um, is there something like a kind of a Jeremy patented trademark teaching of comics that you've kind of put out into the world? Is there something um, like an essential you in the classroom? Uh, that's a great question. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, teaching with Paul, and I, I should also add that we've been very, very lucky uh, to have Karen Green as a comics librarian. Uh, oh, yeah. Who yeah. has really sort of built up uh, a yeah. remarkable collection. Um, but, you know, one of the is exactly what we were talking about before is you can't be too precious because you have a guy who was literally in the room when they were making Watchmen, right, saying, you know, well, that's not what happened. You know, you can theorize all you want, Dauber, but you know, I was there, and we were like you said, we had an eleventh hour deadline, and so we did this. Um, and that kind of humility, you know, is, is great. The other thing, and I'm sure this is true with your students at Austin, with your students at the Ohio State. Um, 
you know, we have wonderful students uh, and, you know, I, I'm very, I make them write for each, uh, you know, I hope I'm not giving any ideas, but I, I make them write for every class. Um, and that way uh, I learn so much from the angles that they have on them, which is which are frequently not my take. Um, and, and so I learn a lot of different uh, approaches because by definition, um, if for no other reason than temporally, although there are many other reasons usually, they're coming from a very different perspective than I am. Um, and that's the nice thing about literature is that there's always different angles to look at the things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Karen, you write, is a remarkable uh, curator, librarian, um, and the, what she's been doing over there for you all is quite extraordinary. Um, so where would you put your money in terms of, you know, the comics, comic studies, its vitality, its, you know, where are we going with this? What do you, what's exciting for you? Well, uh, I guess I'll tell you the sort of like a, a story, you know, when I started my academic career, I really started it in, um, in, in, in Jewish literature, and particularly in, in Yiddish, um, this particular literature. Uh, and I, people asked me why I was interested in this. And I said, you know, it was like, if you talk, it's the, it was the equivalent in terms of the field of if you talk to someone about Shakespeare and they'd said, well, nobody's ever written a biography of the guy. There's one good book on Hamlet. There's this Scottish play, I think. Maybe it's Scottish, maybe it's Irish. Nobody really knows. Um, you should probably do some work on it. You know, the field, you know, it was wide open uh, of in Yiddish literature 25 years ago or so when I sort of got into it. Um, I think comics is, you know, there are more people working on comics. It's a little, you know, it certainly is further along, but there's still so many amazing wor works, areas that are just totally un you know, not only undiscovered, there's other undiscovered, totally unthought about. Um, we're also at a period, however, where there's a huge fan base that is willing to pay money for people like Fantagraphics to put tremendously beautiful and coherent and comprehensive editions uh, of some of this amazing stuff, as well as many other publishers uh, in these things. So our basic, you know, uh, ways of investigating, um, you know, is this something I want to look more into, uh, uh, you know, are, are, uh, is available. Um, and then, you know, a theme that you and I have been going back and forth on in this hour, um, which I think is important, is just opening up to sort of the wider world. So, for example, I was just watching a 1955 Jerry Lewis movie, Artists and Models. Um, and maybe someone has written about this, and, and, and I apologize if I have not seen it, but it's all about comic books, right? It's all about uh, Jerry Lewis being sort of his typical Jerry Lewis character, but the idea is that his mind is sort of rotted by comics. Um, and that explains Jerry Lewis, right? Is it because it's right after all those sort of senatorial hearings. Uh, and just sort of that kind of charge of saying, let's look at these things in conjunction with that very particular kind of moment uh, of their time and other cultural media, not just in the political media, I think is something that, 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 that's going to lead to a, a tremendous amount of excitement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, but there's a lot of great work happening now, a lot of brilliant work that's happening now. I can't wait to, you know, have it, see it continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so inspiring. Um, gosh, so inspiring. Um, is there a, a part two, a volume two in the works? Um, or what is, what are you working on? <laughs> well, uh, you know, it, it is, it is funny. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking now uh, about writing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give uh, certainly writing a, uh, the next chapters of this arrest for a number of years to kind of see what's going on with that. Uh, although I love talking about it uh, with Bill like you and you know, mm -hmm. seeing if something will come up, I'm, I'm certainly not against it. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, I really became so interested in the horror comics mm -hmm. through, uh, through this. And, and, and so I think that there's, you know, similarly, nobody has written, to the best of my knowledge, a real kind of sweeping story of what scared the crap out of Americans from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, indigenous people to you know yesterday um and i think that is going to be a fun that a fun book to sort of think about um and you know comics is going to play a, a central role in it but it's not the only thing by any mm -hmm. wonderful beautiful um 
Well, certainly comics histories, the archive, the questions we bring to it, they matter. Your work is hugely significant. It's going to, um, going to and has already had a huge impact on the field and beyond. Jeremy, thank you so much. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.